Hello, everybody, and welcome to Baby Steps Video Post Production and Promotion. Really quickly, um, just a little bit of information about using ReadyTalk, which is the webinar platform that we'll be using today. If you have any questions either about how to use ReadyTalk or the content that will be um, explained later, you can go ahead and type those questions in the chat pane on the left-hand side of your screen. And we'll either get back to you in the chat pane, or if it's a content question, I will be re reading those out loud to the presenters after their sections. Um, and they'll be answering them audibly. So we will be getting to your questions. Just go ahead and type those questions in the chat pane throughout the webinar. And just as a reminder, again, all of your lines are muted. And so you be, if you are trying to talk to us, we will not be able to hear you. If you do lose your Internet connection, um, you can reconnect using the link that was emailed to you. So just as you just got into the webinar a couple of minutes ago, you can get into it the same way again throughout the webinar. And if you do lose your phone connection, um, you can, if you did dial in to listen to us, you can redial that phone number at any time as well. And if for some reason you have to leave the webinar at any time, know that we are recording today's session and we will be sending out the recording in a follow-up email that goes out after the webinar has ended. So probably later this afternoon you, sh you should receive that email. And that email will also include um, presentation materials, um, so some worksheets that one of our presenters is referencing, will be referencing today, as well as the presentation slides and some applicable links. So a little bit about who is presenting today. My name is Kyla Hunt, and I will be facilitating for TechSoup. And also on the call with us will be Anna Foote. Anna is the Early Literacy Lifelong Learning Coordinator for the State Library of Kansas. And she has been instrumental in providing early literacy information and support to Kansas parents, child caregivers, and librarians. And at the session she will provide practical tips on how to interact with children under age 6 to give them the 6 skills children need to have by age 6 to be ready to learn to read. And then also with us today is Erin Bramley, who is the co-founder and executive director for Lights, Camera, Help. And in this role, he is responsible for conceptualizing the organization's vision and working to see it through. He focuses mainly on communication, collaboration, nonprofits, video, social media, and the bleeding edge technology behind these things. He learns, he teaches, he shares, and he works to make the world, or at least a small part of it, a better place. And then towards the end of the webinar, you don't see his picture here, but just to let you guys know, we will be hearing from Jeremy Camo from Further by Design, who will be giving a little bit more information about the Baby Steps video competition that I will also be um, mentioning in a couple of minutes. And then on the chat pane, you'll see um, Becky's name, Becky Wiegand. She is, um, she is part of TechSoup. She is in charge of the webinar program there. And so you'll be saying hi to her. And a little bit about what we are going to be covering today. Um, I'm going to start off um, with, by introducing TechSoup and who we are. Then we'll be hearing from Anna on the 6x6 at the State Library of Kansas, followed by Aaron talking to us a little bit about post-production editing, specifically with the YouTube editor, as well as some distribution and SEO tips. And again, at the end of the hour we will be hearing Jeremy talk a little bit about Baby Steps. And after each um, presenter has gone, I will be reading some questions out loud from some of you, and the presenters will go ahead and answer those audibly. So quickly before we um, go ahead and you know, talk a little bit about TechSoup and then get into the content, I did want to mention a little bit about the Baby Steps video competition that we'll be hearing more about later. Um, so the Baby Steps video competition is a competition that asks, here's what I do with my kids, what do you do with yours? And as um, a, a collaborator with with this competition, TechSoup has been providing a series of four webinars, and this webinar is of course the last of these four. And all of the archives for the previous webinars will be sent in that follow-up email and posted on the TechSoup website. Um, just to let you guys know, so most of these webinars, how they're, how they're organized is that we first have 
um, a speaker talk a little bit about um, early childhood education or how they get children to, to engage and a little bit about that for the framing of the Baby Steps competition. And then we go into the production or post-production, in this case, um, section. So if for some reason you are you know, a member of one of those organizations that is not engaged in early childhood education and just want to find out more about how to create videos to promote your organization's mission, most of, that, most of this webinar will be applicable to you. Um, and we'll just be the section at the beginning that will be, be um, focusing on the early childhood education portion. So I did want to let you know a little bit about that, about that framing that we're providing today, um, just so you guys are aware. And so we'll be hearing a little bit more about Baby Steps towards the end of this webinar. So a little bit about TechSoup. TechSoup is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a clear focus. We connect fellow nonprofits, charities, public libraries, and foundations with those tech services and products that they need to help them fulfill their mission. TechSoup has been around since the, since the 1980s and has served more than 210,000 210, charitable organizations. And they've distribu distributed more than 11 million software and hardware donations and has reached more than 400,000 nonprofit, library, and philanthropy subscribers with their newsletters each year. And as always, TechSoup has a lot of new things happening. They have new consulting services, which is a new service that they're providing, as well as new software donations including Windows 8.1 and QuickBooks 2014, which will be available at, in 2014. <clears throat> and if you want to find out more about TechSoup, you can go to our website at techsoup.org to find out more. So with that, I wanted to go ahead and give the floor over to Anna Foote to go ahead and talk to us a little bit about 6x6. Six so take it away, Anna. Okay, thank you, Kyla. Um, as Kyla mentioned, uh, my name is Anna Foote. I am the Early Literacy Lifelong Learning Coordinator for the State Library of Kansas. And I'm here to talk about Early Literacy and um, our program 6x6. Six 6x6 by six. Six by six stands for 6 skills by 6 years. And the idea is that there are 6 early literacy skills that children need to have in place to be ready to learn to read by about age 6. And early literacy is what children know about reading and writing before they can learn to read and write. So today we're not talking about getting kids to read early. Um, we're just talking about getting them ready to learn to read. And uh, as I mentioned, 6 by 6 is the early literacy initiative that the State Library of Kansas has chosen to support in all Kansas public libraries. It is a research-based program, and it's adapted from a national library program. And 6x6 was uh, developed and adapted from that national program by the Johnson County Library, which is a suburban library in the Kansas City area. And basically what 6x6 does is encourage parents, librarians, teachers, and caregivers to give children early literacy experiences before age 6 so that they can head to kindergarten to be and ready to learn to read. And today I uh, plan to give you a little bit of um, information on what the skills are and activities that you can do with children that will help you, um, help you develop early literacy skills for them and maybe give you some good ideas for video too. So let's move on. These are the six early literacy skills, and I'm going to be talking about them, um, about each one uh, soon. So one thing I wanted to stress up front is that 6 by 6 isn't just about reading time. And we'll be talking about ways that you can, can work these six skills into any interaction that you have with children. So let's move on to the next skill, or the first skill we'll talk about. It is Have Fun With Books. And these next few slides uh, go along with a handout um, th that was available at, um, in the confirmation email you received and will be available in the follow-up. And also um, if you're listening to the archive, it's available on the archive page for the webinar. Um, but the first handout we're going to talk about is the Six Skills Tip Sheet. And um, so Have Fun With Books is about enjoying reading. And it's also known as print motivation um, in some early uh, education circles. And the idea with this is that in order to want to learn to read, kids need to see that reading is fun and that reading has meaning. 
And so um, that's the skill. And some ideas for fostering the skill in children is um, there are many on the handout, but I just wanted to highlight a couple. One is that you don't have to read an entire book. You can even just look at one page and talking about pictures, and that can be fun for children and show them that reading has meaning. And another idea for this skill is to ask lots of questions about what you're seeing around you and what you're reading. And if children are too young to answer, go ahead and answer for them. This exposes children to a lot of language and gets them used to the idea of having a conversation. So even, even babies, um, if you, you know, ask them questions and then pause and answer for them, um, that's, a, that's a good thing for their early literacy skill development. A second skill, talk, talk, talk. This is basically vocabulary, just knowing the names of things, concepts, and ideas. Uh, reading especially enhances this skill because uh, one study found that books have, children's books have three times more rare words than our usual speech. So it's a great way to expose children to new vocabulary because there are so many um, more unusual words in, in uh, printed uh, or in books. Um, and this is important because the more words children hear and know, the easier it will be for them to recognize words when they are sounding them out. So if you think about a word like pantry, P-A-N-T-R-Y, um, the first part looks like pan when, when kids are sound, sound, sounding it out. The second part looks like try. Um, so pan try, pan try. If, I'm, if I've never heard the word pantry and I'm trying to sound that out, it's going to be much harder to get to to what the word is versus if I know the word pantry. So that's just one example of, of um, how knowing lots of words can be important for children. A couple of ideas to, to work with this skill is one is to add to children's words. So if you're talking to a toddler and um, your, your toddler says, oh, ball, you can say, right, that's a blue ball and it's big too. It would be fun to play with. So um, you know, toddlers are learning like learning concepts like blue, so it helps reinforce that, and, and ideas like it would be fun to play with. So in, enriching children's language that way is a, is a great way to build early literacy skills for them. And then one other thought with vocabulary is when you're reading, don't skip over unfamiliar words. I know it's very tempting, um, but it, it's best to pause and talk about them. Um, or if you maybe say you're working with a group of kids and you don't want to stop the flow of the story, Story, um, or it's an exciting part and it's the first time through, you can also preview words before you start reading with children. So that's one other idea. Our next skill is take time to rhyme, sing, and play word games. And these are all ways that um, get children to hear the smaller sounds in words. So this is also something that is important when children are learning to sound out words. They need to be able to hear the smaller parts of words. And um, ideas that go along with this skill is, um, are to sing and play music often. Music helps kids hear the smaller sounds in words. Um, and then uh, talking about words that rhyme, so what rhymes with cat, naming as many things as you can that rhyme with cat. Um, and then also another thing is talking about words that have alliteration, which meaning they start with the same sound, so words like chugga chugga choo choo, something like that. So rhyming and alliteration are, are great ways to hear those smaller sounds in words because if you think about it, rhyming words are words that start with different sounds but end with the same sound. So it's easier to, it, as you hear those, it's easier to hear those different sounds. And then alliteration is just the opposite. They're words that end with different sounds. Our next skill is notice print all around you. And this is, uh, means that children are able to see print everywhere and know that it has meaning and rules. And noticing print includes, um, as I mentioned, seeing print everywhere, seeing people re uh, writing, and seeing that writing has meaning. So a great, way, great thing to do with that is to um, sit down and, and make out your shopping list with your, with your children. Um, and then another couple things about noticing print, um, one is children developing pre-writing skills like scribbling and drawing and also children learning how to handle books. So knowing what, which side is right side up and that we turn the page, how to turn the pages, and that um, you know, in English we read from left to right, up, up and down. Um, so some, other, some ideas to, 
give children this skill include having them help you turn the pages while you're looking at books or touch the screen when you're using devices. Um, and then another thing while you're reading to point to some of the words, just outline them as, underline them as you're reading um, because otherwise children can think you're just telling stories about the pictures. And that's a good thing too, but we do want children to have that ability to notice that there are words on this page. And so uh, occasionally pointing to some of the words will help with that. And then also just pointing out words you see all around on signs, on, on somebody's t-shirt as you're walking by. And another thing you can point out are um, the differences between letters and numbers and punctuation marks, um, especially for kids who are getting to be five or four or five or six years old, a little bit older in the age group that we're talking about. The um, punctuation marks can be really interesting for them and, and uh, another facet of understanding print. And next we have Look for Letters Everywhere, which um, is basically knowing that letters are different from each other and that they have different names and sounds. So this again goes to that sounding out as you're learning to read. Um, and so learning the names and sounds of letters is a process. Very young children, babies maybe up to about age 2, learn the concept of same versus different so that they have that foundation to say this, these two letters are the same or these two letters are different. And then toddlers, you know, about ages 2 or 3 are starting to learn the names of shapes which are the building blocks of letters. And because if you think about it, like a capital A kind of looks like a triangle or maybe even two triangles. Um, an O is a, an oval or circle kind of thing. So, um, so that's what, where toddlers are with that. And then preschoolers, you know, about ages 3 to 6, learn the names of letters and then finally learn the sounds. So that's the process that, that kids go through. And you notice I said about a lot of times there. And, and that's just because, um, you know, as, as most of us probably know already, children develop at different rates and, and there's, a, there's always a, um, a window of, of where kids might develop. Some kids will develop earlier and some will develop certain skills later. So um, some ideas for this skill are um, frequently asking children if two things are the same or different and talking about ways they might be the same and ways they might be different. This is especially handy when children are getting ready to learn uppercase and lowercase because an uppercase A and a lowercase A look a lot different as do most letters, but they also have some ways that they're the same. And then one other thing you can do is uh, choose a letter of the day, which is, uh, so listen for words that begin with that sound, and then cheer or clap or raise your hand or whatever when you hear that sound. So that helps children start to, a uh, little bit older children start to identify the sound and the letter together. And our, our next skill, excuse me, is tell stories about everything. And um, this is uh, uh, the skill. This skill means that children understand that stories have a sequence, so that they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And not just stories, but many things we do during our day have that that beginning, middle, end piece. Um, so sequencing includes that, and then also first, then last, or big, bigger, biggest. Those those kinds of things. Children can learn sequencing by retelling stories, and they can also learn sequencing by sorting items like blocks or buttons or um, anything like that, that uh, by size, shape, or color, anything that they can do by grouping things by the same or the different categories that helps with this tell stories about everything skill. And a couple of ideas for this skill are, um, one is talking about what you're doing while you're doing it. So you know, if it's time to change baby's diaper or say you're making lunch, you can say, oh, it's time for lunch. So let's make a sandwich. First we need the bread. We're going to have two pieces of bread. And then we're going to put a piece of cheese in the middle. And then we'll put the other piece of bread on top and cut the sandwich in half. And um, we're ready for lunch. So that's a very simple beginning, middle, end um, concept for, for, to work on with children. And then also another important way to learn sequencing is using numbers a lot. So counting things as often as you can, the number of apples in a bowl, the number of people in this room, anything else you can see to count. So those are our six skills and some ways to help children learn them. So next I wanted to move on to a broader look at how um, how to interact with children and to help them get early literacy experiences. This slide is also a handout, and it um, 
just list some, some everyday activities that are also opportunities for early literacy interaction. And so as I mentioned earlier, 6 by 6 isn't or early, any early literacy activity isn't just about reading time. You can definitely do it throughout the day. And so um, there are a lot of things on here, and I bet you can think of ways that they relate to early learning. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. One is um, uh, under pretend play and storytelling. Uh, those are great because they help children learn vocabulary, and they also help children learn that idea of beginning, middle, and end. Um, and then rich language, I mentioned earlier with the example of the ball, it gives children, um, so adding to children's words gives them more exposure to language and helps them learn um, new words and concepts. So that's, that's a good one. Um, and then playing with books, uh, I mean actually playing with them as objects, that's one way that kids can see that books are fun. Um, and it, uh, it helps them learn that reading is fun. And actually for very young children, infants, it's appropriate for them to eat the books because taste is a major way infants experience the world. And um, so uh, that's, that's kind of an idea of playing with books. So let's move on to take a look at some common toys and how to use them to enhance children's early literacy experiences. This is another handout you have. And on the handout it has a list um, has a, ideas for babies and then ideas for toddlers and uh, preschoolers and tell and mention some of the skills that they especially relate to. So um, that's all written down in the handout. So I'm just going to kind of go through quickly and highlight a couple of things for you. But there are definitely lots of ideas on how to use the, the, the next few things we're going to talk about in, in different ways. So, um, so this, this handout is um, um, what's it, what do they call it? It's toy activity ideas. So um, with this, uh, the activity scarves and ribbon rings um, are they, they, uh, they're both really good for very similar sorts of things. They're, they're great for using with music and movement and dance. Um, and if you have sheer scarves or sheer ribbons, you can put one over the other and play with color mixing, and that gives you a chance to, to talk about um, maybe different colors and, and expand on that vocabulary piece. And you can probably tell by that ribbon ring, um, you can make those very inexpensively. I've made them before with just a, like a shower curtain ring and then any kind of, even just the, the curly um, um, like gift wrapping kind of ribbon too. So, um, so that's a couple things on activity scarves and ribbon rings. And then um, for magnetic letters, this obviously is great for seeing letters everywhere. You can have those throughout your house. Um, and they're also good for playing with words and learning vocabulary and starting to learn to spell. Um, and then mirrors, they create lots of opportunities to talk about what baby sees and, and what baby is doing. Um, because sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's really good for babies' brains to talk to them a lot about what you're doing, but sometimes you kind of run short on conversation. So mirrors are great for, for sparking the conversation. And um, mirrors are great for toddlers and preschoolers because they encourage them to play dress up, which is great for learning to tell stories and exploring language and ideas, those kinds of things. Our next one. Uh, is puppets, and this is a, a natural fit for learning to tell stories and beginning, middle, end, and again exploring vocabulary. Um, children love to to play with puppets, and it really gets them talking and starting to play play story um, play uh, make up stories on their own. So imaginative play, and then our last slide on the common activities are blocks. Um, these are great for encouraging children to talk about what they're doing, which again builds storytelling and vocabulary capability. So, you know, if, if a child's playing with blocks, you can say, "Oh, what are you building?" and you know, "Where's that spaceship going to go?" and it really, a, a, sort of like the mirror, is a good conversation spark, um, also. And then. Um, it also encourages children to work with others, both adults and children, to learn and use their expanding early literacy skills. So it's a great collaborative piece. And so are puppets too. Those are, those are two really great things to get children interacting with each other and um, with the adults in their lives. So 
my, uh, my last screen here has my in contact information. So feel free to contact me. I know we're going to have time for some questions today, but um, feel free to contact me if you come up with questions later. And the handouts also have uh, the website on it, so um, you can check out a little bit more about the 6x6 six six and some ideas that are on our website as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Anna. That was fantastic. Um, one question that I want to go ahead and ask, um, and then we'll probably just go ahead and move on to Aaron to make sure we have enough time and, and we'll to keep an eye out for any other questions, um, was how you go about um, engaging with the community with this information, with this really valuable information, which I personally, with you know, as somebody with a toddler, found really, really helpful. Yes, great. My my own role with the State Library is to support local public libraries in getting this information out. And um, even though 6x6 six six is um, particular to the State of Kansas, all public libraries are very, uh, nearly all I would say, most, very, very most of them are very interested in early childhood literacy. And so um, the, the libraries are active, Mo many libraries are active in getting out to the community and, and letting um, parents know what they've got and uh, providing story times and different programs. I think as far as you know, how this might help if you are looking to create a video, um, many libraries would, would welcome that kind of interaction if you want to get in touch with them. Um, and they may be able to give you some ideas that would, um, of things that you can do even further that would be maybe particular to your area or something that's going on at your library. So um, librarians are very interested in early childhood literacy and very supportive of it. So I really encourage everybody who's interested to get in touch with their local public library to see, see what they've got for you. Awesome. Thank you. And I did want to remind anybody who's on here that is a librarian that the, that the um, Baby Steps video competition is open to librarians as well. Um, so be sure to keep an eye out for that at the end of the session when we're talking about the video competition. So again, thank you, Anna, and I'll keep an eye out for any additional questions. And if we have any, we'll all get to those at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and um, hand it over to Aaron Bramley. Aaron's from Lights Camera Help, and he's going to be talking a little bit about post-production tips, including editing um, your video that you're hopefully making for the Baby Steps Video Competition. So with that, take it away, Aaron. Great. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you all. Um, really great to hear about what's going on um, over in Kansas. Uh, uh, just to sort of see what kind of programs are out there. That's absolutely outstanding. Um, and you know, I think that what we're going to do today is use a little bit of that as an example on um, how we might sort of go about creating a video um, for a program like that. I'm going to give you some very um, sort of broad tips and tricks about editing and distributing your videos. Um, we've got 10 minutes on editing and then 10 minutes on distribution. So albeit it will be um, fairly brief, people have done their entire college dissertation on uh, these subjects. So um, you know, there, there's obviously a lot more, but I want to give you some, some very quick ideas um, and sort of help demystify the process a little bit so that you can go ahead and get started. And the way that we're going to do that is I'm going to simply share my desktop with you guys. So you can sort of see what I'm working on here, and, and we can go ahead and move forward and get some very sort of concrete ideas about what's going on. So as far as uh, editing goes, I like to tell beginners to go ahead and use the YouTube editor. Um, we used to suggest using iMovie and or Windows Movie Maker or some of those other free applications that come with your computer. However, YouTube has come out with this product that's completely free to use. Um, and it has gotten better and better and better over the years. Uh, I think I first experimented with it about three years ago, and since then it has just improved to the point where I absolutely recommend it to folks. Um, so what you're going to see in sort of any video editing application, whether it be the YouTube editor or um, iMovie or Final Cut Pro if you're going to um, really sort of get into it, are sort of the same main components. Um, and those are over here you have your, your viewer that's going to show you what the final product of your video is. You're going to have a clip library, which is all this over here. Um, and in YouTube it actually pulls those from your video manager. So any video that you upload to YouTube is available for you to edit, as well as a few other videos, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. 
down here is what's called the timeline. Um, and the timeline is where all of the actual editing work gets done. Um, it used to be that if you wanted to edit video um, or film, I guess, you had um, actual film that you had to cut and hang and dry and develop and, and uh, go through whole long laborious processes with. Now we have this, this great opportunity to do what's called nonlinear editing, which means that we can take any clip that we want, pick it up, drag it around, move it anywhere in the video, um, really makes the process a lot more simple for us. Um, the other sort of thing that you'll notice about the YouTube editor is that we have uh, some good tools up here, and we're going to go through each one of these tools in a minute here, uh, so you can sort of start to see what they are. Um, but first, the first thing first when you're creating a video, you want to start by going ahead and just naming that project. Any project you're working on, you want to name it and make sure that it saves. It defaults to my edited video here. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and start by naming this just the sample for right now, 6 by 6 um, just to sort of give us an idea uh, about what it is that we're, we're talking about. Now, if you guys were on uh, the first webinar that I did for this, this program, we talked a little bit about Creative Commons content. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull in some Creative Commons content for you guys to see right now. Um, and if you weren't on that webinar, this is a great resource for you to have. It's search.creativecommons.org. And Creative Commons is basically a way of um, people to copyright their content where they actually give you permission to use it. So if you're looking for great music, you want some, some clip art, you want some video that you can use um, in your video, you can go ahead and go to search.creativecommons.org and search for it. And so we're just going to search for reading PSA here. Um, to see whether we can get a good example of a clip that we can use. And you type that in and go ahead and click on YouTube and see what comes up. It looks like we have this PSA from the U.S. Um, Department of, uh, of Education. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, I'm not going to play through the whole thing right now for you because um, probably your frame rate is fairly low and you can't really see it. But you see that there's lots of good clips of parents with their kids. Um, and what's neat about this video is that they have allowed anyone to go ahead and use it if they want to. Um, and YouTube has made that super easy. You see that there's this remix button right here. You can go ahead and click on that and it's going to automatically open this video in your YouTube editor. Uh, and you can see that the clip is right here. Um, and we're back in my, my YouTube editor. And it op actually opened up a new project for us. So we'll go ahead and rename this 6 by 6 right now. Um, but if, for instance, you decided you didn't want to use someone else's content, you wanted to use your own, um, you would click on this Upload button from YouTube.com, upload your content, and it would automatically appear right in here. And uh, as you can see, you simply just take it, click on it, drag it over, and it goes ahead and pops directly into your video right there. Um, so fairly simple. Um, there's uh, a way that you can actually go ahead and view this video in sort of a more um, parsed up way. And you see there's this, this magnifying glass right here. And edit, every video editing software has a version of this. Um, but it's really useful so you can actually see frame by frame what's going on. So you simply click and drag that out and you can see here are all the little sections of our clips um, that we might want to take a look at. And you can see that there's this, this dark space right here at the, the beginning that maybe you want to get rid of. Uh, the YouTube editor makes it super simple. You click on these little scissors to make the cut. Click where you want that cut to be. See here, you click where you want the cut to be. And it goes ahead and divides those into two clips. I want to get rid of the black space because you can see it's just black space. Click on that X and that's now gone. Um, and our video is a little bit better to use. So say, for instance, um, you're using this video and you wanted to go ahead and juxtapose this, uh, this clip of parents reading and walking with their kids, and then before you get to this other footage, you simply wanted to go ahead and trim it there. So you can do that, and then you can actually go ahead and drag your other video clip directly into that. And I'm not sure why there's two versions of this in here, but we'll go ahead and get rid of the second one. 
and you can just sort of click and drag it around, right? Uh, it's very sort of simple stuff. Um, there's a few other things that you're going to notice when you um, are, have a clip highlighted here in YouTube, and that's that it opens up this sort of window of quick fixes. Um, and this can be really helpful for fixing some bad looking footage. Uh, you can see that auto fix here is, is for fixing lighting and color. And so if you have something that looks a little bit green or orange or, or somewhat the wrong color, you can go ahead and just click on that real quick and it will maybe sometimes fix it appropriately. I, I should say be a little bit careful with that because it can um, make your footage look a little bit different colored than, than it should. Um, but this, uh, apparently the lighting was fairly good already. You can see that it didn't make too much of a difference in the clip. Um, can't really quite see what the, the differences are, but that's probably because the person who recorded it did a good job uh, and used lots of nice natural sunlight in order to get some good, good stuff in there. Now, if, in fact, uh, you you use the auto fix and it wasn't working for you, you can click on this brightness and contrast um, button and actually adjust that yourself. Um, and you can see that a little goes a long way with this stuff. Um, but you can make uh, sort of smaller, minute adjustments this way um, just to sort of make your footage look a little better or worse. I'm going to go ahead and unclick that and keep the auto fix button on there for you guys right now just to take a look at. You see that there are other options. Um, moving your clip into slow motion if you wanted, wanted to do that. Uh, be careful with that. Sometimes it can look a little funky. Uh, but that is an option that you have here. As well as uh, what they call pan and zoom. And the pan and zoom is going to be um, a way to add motion to your clips that you, uh, you didn't have before. So if you had um, a whole bunch of photos in here, you could click that pan and zoom button and that would create some motion on those photos as you were sort of uh, playing through them. They call it the Ken Burns effect from um, the Ken Burns documentaries that you may have seen where they have photos that are sort of animated a little bit just kind of how to move uh, back and forth. And on video you can see that that um, doesn't actually really appear to be doing all that much um, in the video here. But perhaps that's why you can see that they've it essentially sort of zoomed in just a little bit just to uh, make the footage look a little bit different. And over the course of the 34 seconds, it's probably going to zoom in even further. Let's see here. So other great things to sort of uh, think about the YouTube editor are that uh, if you want to add music, to your video. They have a great library of music here that you can use. And you can use all of this stuff for free, which is really excellent. Uh, you can even search by genre. So say, for instance, your uh, early childhood literacy video needed some probably not alternative and punk music. Acoustic music is probably the, the way to go for something like this. You can see that there's some great little clips here, and you can play them and sort of listen to them. Uh, you guys obviously aren't hearing this quite yet, which is totally fine. Um, but if you wanted to add that to your video, you simply click on it, drag it over to the audio section. You can see it there. You can lower the volume on it, which you'll want to do. Um, and that's going to go ahead and add some nice background music in there for free for you. Uh, really sort of great to have options. A lot of times people want to know where to find great music. And if you don't want to wade through all the stuff on that Creative Commons website that I, I pointed out to you guys, uh, you can go ahead and use the library right here. There's some really great transitions that uh, exist within the YouTube editor as well. I'd recommend that you use these extremely sparingly. Uh, you are not, unfortunately, I hate to break it to you all, you are not George Lucas. Uh, so you can't get away with using the clock wipe. Um, the, the, the most common transition in all of video is actually the what we call cut to cut transition which means no transition at all. It's one clip fading, going directly into another clip. So not no fade, no cross dissolve, nothing like that. It just goes from one, one clip directly into another one. Um, sometimes you may want to use some other, some other transitions. So if you wanted to do that, you can go ahead and drag those right in there. 
Um, make them a little bit shorter if you wanted to um, by simply clicking and dragging these, these sliders around. Uh, pretty sort of simple, simple stuff there. Another um, opportunity that the YouTube editor gives you is to add titles uh, to your video. So if you have someone speaking like this and you wanted to make sure that you knew who that person was, you can go ahead and add in some great, some great titles. And the one that you're going to mostly want to use um, for adding in titles is going to be this banner effect here. And so you can go ahead and just add that in and you can see that it offers you the opportunity to add it in at the beginning over the entire clip or right at the end. We're going to go just for the beginning right here. Um, actually, that went ahead and added it prior to my clip, which is not what I wanted. wanted to go ahead and add it to the full clip. So you can do that. Um, and you can see that it gives you the option to pick your font, pick uh, whether you need it stylized in some way or another, change the color. Um, you can choose alignment and position. Uh, for instance, if you wanted it on the top of the screen, you could do that and see um, that it sort of comes across there. Uh, change the height of it if you wanted to. Um, so you have lots and lots of options. Uh, I like this, this banner because it allows you to put this, this little um, strip of, of color behind it, uh, and that's going to help make any of your text pop off. Um, so for instance, if you didn't have that, you can see that your white text would completely sort of get blended into that white wall but as soon as you add a little bit of color behind it, you can see that suddenly your text pops out. Now, of course, you can change your text color as well, but oftentimes you have a background or someone's wearing a shirt that has multiple colors in it, and that's kind of tricky. Um, so that's a great way to go ahead and add some good titles in there. Great. Um, there's also some great sort of effects that you can add to some of this stuff. So um, this is the kind of Instagram effect that you can see here. Uh, if you wanted to go ahead and add these to the video, you can see it stylizes it for you. Again, use these things sparingly. Um, nothing smacks of more amateurish video than overused effects. However, sometimes you can use them to, to help increase the, the quality of your video and make things look kind of nice. For instance, the heat map might be something you do not want to use unless you're trying to simulate what a Predator drone might see. Um, flying above your head or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, that's a, a little bit of sort of the basics of the YouTube um, editor. From here, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about distribution because uh, I have a good eight minutes left on my, my section here. But um, the idea is, is that in order for people to see your video, you need to make sure that they can find it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click that, that Publish button, and you'll see that um, it tells me that my video is being processed. But in the meantime, you can go ahead and go through to the video manager on YouTube, find your video, hit edit, and this is where you're going to be able to add in some great information to help your video get found. So um, YouTube is actually the second most popular search engine in the world. Google is the first. Uh, it's probably not a surprise to any of you who, uh, you know, Read, uh, that people use Google a lot, but uh, YouTube uh, is the second most popular search engine, which means that people are searching YouTube more than they're using even Yahoo to find things online. A lot of times they're, they're searching for how-to videos, they're searching for um, something that's entertaining, um, they're searching for something that they heard their friends talk about, they're searching for cats with tinfoil hats, they're searching for all kinds of great stuff. Um, but where does YouTube find that information, and that's from the back end here where you're actually putting in uh, the information to tell YouTube how to actually categorize your video. So some great tips that I can give you to help make things uh, more easily found is that, for instance, if we're uh, advertising and trying to get people to see a video about this 6x6 program, we maybe want to go ahead and include 6x6 in the title um, just to be clear. Uh, and we'll use initial caps just because um, we like good grammar. Um, but the idea is, is that you want to make sure that your title is short uh, and also very descriptive of what the video is about. 
Uh, a lot of times people try to be clever with the titles of their video. This is not a time for you to exercise your creative muscle. Um, so this actually might be the early literacy program. Six by six would be the title of our video. Um, what you're going to want to sort of think about is that when uh, YouTube is actually going out and, and pulling in videos for a search string, that it's first looking at the title of the video, then it's looking at the description of the video, and then it's looking at tags that are associated with the video. Um, and tags are essentially keywords that help YouTube categorize this. And this is sort of the basic of search engine optimization. Um, again, a concept that we could uh, go into for a very long time, but I wanted to sort of give you guys the basics of optimizing your video for search. And so the way that you want to make sure that you do that is that you have excellent keywords in your title, excellent keywords in your description, and then excellent keywords in your tags. And so how do you figure out what keywords you want to use? Well, it's important to think about who your audience actually is. And so if you can put on your hat for a moment that puts yourself in the position of your audience member and what they might actually be searching for in order to come up with your video. Um, so if you think about an early literacy program, then you might want to make sure that you have early literacy um, absolutely everywhere. You might want to think about um, a whole bunch of other keywords. And so I went ahead and drafted up just a few keywords as Anna was talking. I was listening to her and sort of pulling out ideas about what we might go ahead and be able to put into the title of this video. But to, to me, the audience uh, is parents and caregivers for this. It may also be other libraries. It might be nonprofits that have early literacy programs. Um, potentially, it might be schools um, or preschools, that kind of thing as well. But for now, because the program is largely geared towards parents and caregivers, we're going to think about parents and caregivers as our audience for this. And so these were a bunch of keywords that I thought these parents and caregivers might be searching for where we'd want um, information about this program to come up. And so we have early literacy, literacy toys, literacy ideas, literacy activities, kindergarten, because we sort of talked a little bit about that. Um, I just went straight for literacy as well in case someone's searching for just that. That also allows you to um, pair literacy and skills together, for instance, um, if someone's searching for that. So put those all in there. Um, the idea is you want to be as inclusive as possible and put as much in there as you can. Um, so print motivation might be a, a buzzword that someone's talking about. Someone also might be searching for how do I teach my child to read? Um, and so I have teach child and read in there. Um, we have the name of the program. We have ready to read, which is sort of a sub-name of the program. And then help my child read might be something that someone is, is searching for as well. So these are a bunch of great keywords that you go ahead and drop directly into the tag section. And you want to go ahead and uh, separate them by commas. And you can see that it pulls them out as a bunch of different, um, different keywords that you might put in there. Now, in order to really optimize your video for search, you want to make sure that your description that you're typing in here use as many of these keywords as possible. Um, if you want to get really scientific about it, the description should have a 12% keyword density. Now, what does that mean? Well, it basically means every eighth word should be a keyword in the description. Um, that sounds a little bit tough sometimes because you want to actually also make sure that this is something that human beings like to read. Um, so I wouldn't get too caught up on counting words and making sure that your keywords are in there. But basically it's about as many keywords in there as possible. Um, search engines also use what's called the inverse triangle of importance. And if any of you have been to journalism school, um, this is very familiar to you. But basically it, it weights the top two paragraphs much stronger than the bottom two par or the bottom paragraph. So any good information that you want to put in there Make sure that you try to put as much of it into the top two paragraphs as you can. And then um, as you get a little bit further on down, you can uh, do things that are a little bit more generic, um, maybe things that are a little bit more catch-all uh, to, to help 
the sort of long tail of search um, sort of fit in there. Uh, as far as the description goes, you also always want to make sure that you put a link back to your website on there. Um, and that's just going to help the search engine optimization of your website actually more than the video. Uh, it will also sort of help Google and other search engines link this video with your website. If the video is embedded on your website, that's going to help even more. Like I said, there's a lot, lot more that, that can go through here. Um, make sure that your privacy settings are set to public because that's the only way that people are actually going to be able to see your video. Um, and that will also help send everything out to your subscribers if you have any on your YouTube channel. Uh, give you the opportunity to share it on any of these social networks as well. Go ahead and choose a category. If you're a nonprofit, select that nonprofit and activism. Um, education might be the best category for a video like this. And then you want to think about um, after this form is all complete, going ahead and clicking on over to the advanced settings and, and checking those out. Uh, the reason why I say to do this is that um, if YouTube didn't think it was important, they wouldn't include it as an option. So make sure you try to fill out as much of this information as you possibly can to make your stuff findable. Um, this license is uh, something that you can do. Um, it's because we use content from Creative Commons, it's locked us into a license already. Uh, but go ahead and just sort of keep that in mind that you can use the Creative Commons license on your content if you'd like. Make sure that allow embedding, embedding is checked because you want people to be able to take a look at that video anywhere that you want um, them to um, and go ahead and pop that up on their blogs or on their website or anything along those lines. Uh, video location is um, something that is not super used right now when it comes to um, search on YouTube, but it will be soon. Um, as we sort of get more and more into location-based search and people searching for things on their phone, YouTube is going to start serving up content that's rele relevant by location. Um, and the recording date, again, something that I'm not exactly sure if that's going to be super useful to you, but you can go ahead and pop that in there. And then 3D video, you guys are all shooting video in 3D, right? Um, no, probably not something that you have to necessarily worry about just yet, but um, something that you can see is coming along its way. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and return back to our presentation here um, because I am at the end of my time and see whether there are any good questions before we move on to the rest of the webinar. Sure. Thanks, Erin. That was really great. Um, we do have a few questions. One's from Julie Havens. Um, she has a question, question on clips. She wants to know if there's a way to convert a clip, so a photo or a video clip, to a photo like a JPEG. Um, she didn't know if there's a way to do that either on YouTube or by putting it into Flickr or Photoshop. Yeah, so um, there's a few ways to do that. One would be if you have a more advanced editing software, um, like Final Cut for instance, you can go ahead and create still images from that. Um, something that you might also think about is just open the video on your computer and then open up a screen capture program. Um, and you can go ahead and just take a picture of it right from your screen and then boom, suddenly you have that clip that you're looking for. So that might be a good way to do that. From YouTube itself, I'm not, I don't believe there's a way to actually export a photo of a single frame. Okay, great. Thanks. And we also have another question that is asking, should you use the keyword tags that autofill on YouTube when you start um, typing your own, um, or should you use both? I mean, should you type your own, or should you use the autofill? Right, exactly. Uh, I think that probably at this point you want to use both. Um, the auto, definitely use the autofill um, as you start, as you start um, typing and, and if something that you see is relevant comes up, definitely use that because that means that YouTube is pressuring people to sort of move in that general direction. And so if someone is searching, then that autofill will also start coming up. You want to make sure that you're using that as well. When I do this, I like to use the autofill, and then I also like to use my own. Um, you know, I, I fill my keyword tags to capacity. So uh, there's a certain number of characters it allows you to use. I think it's 
something like 250 characters or, or something along those lines. But I just keep going until it says, sorry, Aaron, you're overloading us, no more. <laughs> um, so uh, definitely use as many of the YouTube autofill ones and then add your own for the rest. Okay, got it. And we, I think we have one more question, um, and it's asking, do you recommend putting your actual website URL as a keyword or in the description? I would put that in the description, not as a keyword. Got it. Um, I think that's about all the questions that have come in. Do you have a, a good resource, um, SEO resource that you would recommend if people want to learn more about that? Um, there's plenty of great content online. Um, I am blanking on my favorite right now, um, but I will go ahead and send that over to you so that you can send that out in the links okay, after cool. the webinar. I'll go ahead and get that. Yeah. That would be great. All right, thank you, Aaron. That was fantastic. And um, with that, I want to go ahead and hand it over to Jeremy Camo from Further by Design. He's going to talk a little bit about um, the Baby Steps video competition. Um, and I know this slide right here says that it ends on, in February, on February 1st, but as you will see in a later slide, it actually ends a little bit later than that. But he will fill us in on that a little bit more in a minute. So Jeremy, take Absolutely. it away. Thank you, Kayla. I appreciate it. And before I get started, I want to send a huge thank you to um, to the TechSoup Global team who has been absolutely instrumental in pulling this together. Um, Kayla mentioned some of the webinars that we have previously provided, um, and they provide a lot of, of kind of perspectives and whatnot on how we can actually go about creating some of these messages and these films. Um, so do go take a look at that. Um, also, thank you to Aaron and Anna um, for helping us talk through this today. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, in this so that we can kind of wrap up on time, um, but did want to kind of talk about why this was important for us here at Further and for um, the Kellogg Foundation. I think through a lot of the work that, that we've done in early childhood education, um, we've recognized that you know actually getting the public to understand what high quality early childhood education looks like um, and why it's important. It's one of the, the biggest challenges. Um, and so through this competition, we're really excited to get people actually talking about the importance of early childhood education. And perhaps more importantly, to give people from across the country ideas on different things that we might be able to do with our kids, um, with our children, and with our students. And so kind of with that, um, I do want to kind of go through um, a video that kind of highlights the competition and kind of explains what it's all about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why you guys might want to get involved involved in, in submit videos besides just to promote the, the importance of early childhood education. Um, and then as Kayla mentioned, um, talk about uh, deadlines and things like that. Um, so with that, we'll go to a short video. Um, you can't remember, but there was a time when you couldn't walk, when just trying to was an adventure. But sometimes was a step too far. You can't remember but someone helped you, picked you up, comforted you, helped you take your first step. This winter, Invest Early invites parents, families, caregivers, and educators nationwide to answer one question. This is what I do with my child. What do you do with yours? The Baby Steps competition asks you to submit videos that capture a snapshot of how we care for children during the first five years of their lives. For parents and families, we're looking for short videos taken by iPhone or by camera, whatever you have that's able to capture the simple, everyday things you do with your child or family member. For care providers and teachers, we want to help you generate videos by capturing all the creative things you do to inspire your students, whether it's reading, singing, playing, or coloring. 
The Baby Steps competition will be running from December 2nd to February 2nd and will be recognizing winners based on four criteria. Their emotional value, their educational value, the creativity of the activity, and the quality of the video. Go to babystepscompetition.com to learn more about how to enter and see why we believe the first five years of a child's life are vital to invest in. Great. Um, so I do want to kind of really reiterate that while, you know, the Dirty Robert team did do an amazing job at pulling this together, um, we are looking for videos from both, you know, parents and families um, and from educators, whether they're care providers, teachers, advocacy groups, um, libraries mentioned earlier. Um, and they can be filmed with whatever we have on hand. So whether it's cameras or phones, or if we actually have, you know, a, a nice camera to actually do this type of work. So it really um, is hoping to gather a whole variety of different types of, of content. Um, there are some prizes for, for the competition, which we're really excited about. Um, the Kellogg Foundation, the Packer Foundation, has really helped to kind of make this possible. Um, they are all um, available here and on the website um, if you kind of want to refer back to them later. Um, there are some kind of rules that it might be important to look through, um, and also some guidelines for how to submit, um, which includes kind of posting the video either on Instagram or YouTube or, or um, Vimeo, um, and then entering the competition through Facebook. Um, and so kind of with that, um, the competition um, deadline has been extended until um, February 18th to give everyone a little bit more time to kind of pull these things together. Um, and so the, we are really excited. I want to reiterate um, that um, there are four previous webinars that help everyone to kind of pull together these narratives, um, actually do some of the filming, um, and then what you do with it as Aaron was kind of um, uh, explaining to us today. Um, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Kayla. Um, and hopefully, we're uh, wrapping up almost on time. Great, thank you, Jeremy. That's fantastic. And yep, about just on time. Um, I do want to thank all of our all of our speakers today. So Jeremy, Aaron, and Anna. I want to thank you all for your for your hard work on this webinar. And I want to thank everybody for their time today in attending the webinar. And of course, Becky on the back end. Thank you. Um, if you would, when you exit the webinar, you should see a survey pop up, and it will also be in the follow-up email. If you could take just a couple of minutes and, and go ahead and fill that survey out, it does help us in creating new and better webinars in the future. And one last thank you to our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, who does provide this great webinar platform that we, that we worked on today. So again, thank you all, and I hope you all have a great day. <laughs>